Hi everybody, this is Eric Johnson. I'm here with Tober. He's at my feet, at my knee I should say, and I hope that he stays sedate and doesn't start messing with the camera. I realize that's irritating on behalf of a couple, of, I must have picked up some listeners because I had a couple of guys say, turn off that damn water. People had complained about it in the past, but sporadically. But now I guess I got some new viewers and, and I realized what a big pain it was for people. So I turned it off. And one guy said he had to keep going to the bathroom. Then he couldn't even follow the video. I think that was his clever way of telling me he could hear the water. Okay. Right now for the forest fed people. We're in limbo. We're in limbo because... The two court cases that I know of that are holding things up, Erskine and Anderson, the judges have both, in both cases, I believe at this point, and if I'm wrong, correct me, it's not really a point of my video today, but in both cases of these, uh, but in both cases, the judges saw the complaints by these two people against Forrest Fenn. In Anderson's case, it was against Forrest Fenn and an unknown uh, defendant. That would be the finder that she doesn't know who he is, that she wants to find out who he is. And in both cases, the judges said, your arguments are not up to snuff, and you need to go back and refine them and make them a better argument for the court to take them seriously. I put in the seriously part for the court to take them on. And so that's what's holding up everything right now, as far as I'm concerned, is that both Erskine and Anderson have to come up with good arguments that the cases uh, take seriously enough to debate. And if they don't, I think at least the legal hurdles for the finder to release his information will be gone. And uh, the finder's pretty much holding up everything because Forrest Fenn has said he'll do whatever the, for the finder wanted. Right, Tober? Tober looks up at me like I am freaking, I don't know what when I do these. There's something about him that just really gets him moony-eyed. Moony-eyed. Okay, here's my, t I'm going to talk today about Barbara Erskine. I'm going to talk today about Barbara Anderson. My take on Barbara, and I'm specifically going to talk about her text messages. Barbara Anderson, this is what she feels happened to her in a nutshell. She believes she figured out where the solve was. And she had it down to a particular area. And she was, I mean, she's right in this particular area. And then she, it took her two years to refine the search when she got down to this area. And she said, after finding the general location, this is her court case, by the way. I'll put a link to it. After finding the general location of the last clue answer, Anderson found physical markings that verified she was at the final treasure location or very near same. By the way, she's her own attorney in this. I don't know if that was a good idea. Most attorneys would say 100% it's not a good idea to be your own attorney. She is an attorney, but she is a real estate lawyer. So, she has legal training. It's not her field, but treasure hunting, I'm not sure that's anybody's field to be uh, doing a lawsuit with. Anderson then spent two more years deciphering the balance of the poem, narrowing down the physical location of the treasure. Uh, after finding the general location, Anderson incurred substantial monies and time physically looking. A lot of us know that. I certainly did not. I mean, I spent over the course of four years... Yeah, I probably spent 10000 12000 on trips out to the Rockies and back. I didn't... You know, that's, I mean, for four years, that's not bad, I don't think. I think I took five trips, say 15 grand total. Some, I mean, I'm saying that in the context of some people spent buttloads of money. Some people lost their homes, right? Some people mortgaged their homes, refinanced to get another loan to get, to keep the treasure hunt going for them. It's tragic what some people did. Some people quit their jobs to go look for the treasure. Some people went bankrupt. Uh, 
Fenn has been uh, many long many years ago. Fenn said that he had someone coming to him and very angry. He said, "You owe me a lot of money because he wanted Fenn to pay him back for all the money he had spent because he had basically just ruined his life financially." That's terrible. But we're all adults, and that's not something people should be able to sue Fenn for. I'm getting far afield. Anyway, Anderson lost a lot of money doing this. Um, now, here's where I would like to say this about Barbie Anderson. I feel sorry for Barbie Anderson. Now, I'm going to read these text messages between her and Joe. Joe is the guy that she feels was hacking her and who was texting her, messaging her, and basically making her life a living hell. And I think at the time this guy, Joe, uh, was bullying her, which is just no other word for what happened. Um, I think Barbara Anderson was distraught, and I would say well, I would say she was not thinking clearly. I, I mean, you'll see what I mean when I'm about to read this. Talk about confirmation bias. You know what confirmation bias is, right? It was one of my first videos. Um, confirmation bias is, to, to, in a nutshell, you can go back to what it really means scientifically, and it's absolutely fascinating how the mind works putting together patterns. For us, confirmation bias meant that we would read a lot into what we were seeing and reading and watching and, we, and hearing. And we would put those patterns together and they would fit our solve. And uh, that's what she did. And when you hear this in her court filing, I think you're going to understand how bad it was. Over the years, Forrest Fenn, this, is, this was uh, paragraph 8. Over the years, Forrest Fenn has quietly acknowledged Anderson as the solver of the poem puzzle. Over the years, Forrest Fenn has quietly acknowledged Anderson as the solver of the poem slash puzzle. This is Anderson has written this. She is the lawyer. So she is saying, over the years, Fenn has quietly acknowledged to me that I'm solving the puzzle. Sample references. <laughs> it's not funny, Eric. This woman is a, is a little, she's off. I'm just saying that. I'm, I, like I said, I have sympathy for her. I think anyone that gets just kind of crazed out on this hunt, your mind can play a lot of tricks. I guess I could say every, every trip I went on, I was reading a lot into what I was doing. But this is what she said in her uh, case. She said, Forrest Fenn has quietly acknowledged her as the solver. Sample references can be found in his Dizzy Dean scrapbook, his Rooster Cogburn scrapbook, his reference to Bohemian, because she's Czech, and in that region of Europe, uh, Bohemia is Czech, German, I think. His reference to, quote, Dr. Lawyer, Anderson's ex-husband is a doctor, and she, of course, is a lawyer. His, Fenn's, reference to Barb in a scrapbook. His reference to a boa. Anderson wore a boa in an old law firm photo. And several other examples. So you can see that Ms. Anderson is reading all these things with Forrest Fenn over the years. Scrapbooks, in his books, etc., and she's just simply reading into references herself. Not really that unusual a thing to have happen. I will say this about Forrest Fenn. I also read Erskine. I read the Hearst. Hearst are the father-son team. The Hearst family, of course, are the ones who thought they had to solve. Contacted Mr. Fenn last winter told him what they were going to be doing, and Mr. Fenn said, wait till the mud dries and the snow melts. So they didn't go out and get the treasure that they thought they had the clue to. And then on June 5th, they contact Fenn, and they tell him again, okay, now, basically now can we go out? And supposedly Fenn said, in so many words, okay, well then June 6th, 
he announces the treasure's been found. So they're another one who thought that they had been bamboozled, but they don't want to sue Forrest Fenn. But the point I was going to make is, I read some stuff about their story. And what they believed was, and I think this happened in a number of cases, and I'm not sure there was a way out of this necessarily even for Forrest Fenn, but they believed when Forrest Fenn would communicate with them and basically not say no when they're speculating about where they're going and what they're doing, they thought he was encouraging them. They thought he was saying, you're on the right track. I think this happened with different hunters. I think that people were emailing Finn, and they'd say, you know, tomorrow I'm going to be in uh, Taos, and then I'm going to go up a certain, go into a certain mountain, and there's a stream there or whatever, and Finn would go, okay, okay, good luck on that. And they would think, that was just purely made up, they would think he was saying they're on the right track. Again, we're dealing with that kind of confirmation bias stuff where you're, you're reading into stuff. You're seeing stuff that could or could not be there. And in this case, not there. So anyway, Miss, Miss Anderson saw a lot of stuff going on there. Um, Forrest Fenn had e hundreds of emails from Anderson. She sent photographs. Um, and then we have the unknown defendant come out of left field with his solve that he stole from Anderson. Prior to her most recent search of the physical treasure, Anderson received prank text messages from the unknown defendant. In those text messages, unknown defendant told Anderson he was stalking her and made multiple comments about her private body parts to harass her. I have no idea what that has to do with the treasure hunt. In fact, that makes me think this guy... Well, first of all, I just don't believe this guy was hacking Miss Anderson at all. I think what this guy was doing was just plain old cyberbullying. I think he was playing with her mind, so to speak. I think he was just being a jerk. And uh, she fell for it. I mean, if someone's writing you about your body parts, that's pretty far afield of the treasure. And that has nothing to do with being hacked. You don't have to go hack someone's computer. I mean, unless they have nudes in their computer. Well, she didn't address that. I don't know about that at all. Here's where it's interesting. Anderson considered his messages harmless until it was announced the treasure had been found. So without any further ado, I'm going to read these messages. On one level, the, me the messages are very serious, and they're very mean-hearted, and they're disturbing. On another level, for me at least, I find them funny. <laughs> Folks, if you stick with me as these videos going on and we get into other areas besides Forrest Fane, you're going to say I have an absurdist view of the world. I have an absurdist view of life. That's the only way I've made it this far without being overly dramatic. I mean, sometimes when things just have seemed pretty bad in the past, I've always thought, well, I've always thought two things. I've always, and I'm having to think pretty far back for anything bad in my life, but I've always thought two things. Things are always going to get better. Probably would change that opinion on my deathbed. But otherwise, things are always going to get better. And secondly, Ultimately, I just find things absurd, and therefore, when I reach that realization with whatever is going on in my life, I, I just find it funny, because so much of life, I think, is absurd. And, to some extent, I think these text messages are absurd. But these text messages, and they start on June 6th, the day of the find, these text messages between... Joe and Barb are, they run the gamut. But I think it becomes very clear early on in this that Joe is simply playing with Barb Anderson. And Barb Anderson, unfortunately, is in that state of mind 
where she's too wrapped up in the solve. She's too wrapped up in the idea that she has been thwarted, that she has been robbed of the solve. She is so convinced that she had the treasure within her grasp, although she never quite got a grasp on it physically, that she has had it ripped away from her. And, if, and I know a lot of us kind of had that feeling of the rug being pulled out from under us uh, when we heard the announcement that Forrest Fenn, uh, the Forrest Fenn treasure had been found. Well, just imagine that a thousand times more, because I think that's what Barb Anderson felt like. She was literally out there, and I think she just felt like, oh my God, I had it within reach. But of course, as we know, and have known from the very beginning, you had to get the treasure within your physical grasp to win the treasure hunt. That was always what you had to do, not just figure it out. Forrest Fenn could have said in the beginning, you know, like someone said, Forrest Fenn could have done two things if he wanted to retrieve the chest. He could have just said, I'm going to retrieve the chest. Well, here we go back into the whole conspiracy thing of which I have fallen a little bit prey to. You know, it occurred to me that, and other people, I'm not, I'm not the new one on this. It occurred to me that Forrest might have had, everyone seems to pick on poor Shiloh. Forrest Fenn had Shiloh, his grandson, go out and retrieve the treasure, because all we have seen is Forrest Fenn with his treasure. And, of course, Forrest Fenn didn't tell us. All he said, he said, here are photos. It's been found. Here are photos of me with the treasure. And he didn't say things like, oh, you know, I met with the guy. The guy said I could try on the bracelet, this and that. No, he doesn't do that. So we have to kind of fill that in and start, you know, giving conspiracy theories going, well, then in the Erskine trial, he says that. He says that I met with the uh, finder. So that was all put to rest under oath that he met with the finder. But people still think there's some shenanigans going on and that maybe Shiloh went out and retrieved the treasure chest. But the, And I'm so far off the field. But what I was going to say is some people wondered if Forrest Fenn wanted to put it to rest, why he just didn't say, okay, on July 4th, the treasure chest hunt is over, and if you don't find it by then, I'm going to go retrieve it. Uh, I don't know. He could have done that if he wanted to retrieve it. Um, he might have caused some people to do pretty rash things trying to get it that fast, and maybe he was worried about that if, in fact, he had it retrieved. But I'm going back to the point I was trying to make. The point was you had to retrieve the treasure. You had to actually get it. Barb Anderson never did that. So this entire lawsuit, to me, is frivolous. Having said that, I think it's in the public interest. <laughs> I think it's in the public interest that I read these text messages. And I'm going to do it as soberly as possible. June 6th, 